Okay, so it says it's all streaming. We are good to go, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this virtual meeting of the Environment and Performance Committee. My name is Councillor Judith Skinner, and I'm chair for this committee. As is our protocol for ensuring public awareness of who is in attendance this evening, I would ask Jeanette to do a roll call, please. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, if the, each council can just uh, confirm their presence. Um, Councillor George Corner. Present. Uh, Councillor Anton Danny. Present. Councillor Deborah Evans. Present. Councillor Paul Goodale. Present. Councillor Neil Hasty. Present. Councillor Peter Watson. Councillor Judith Wellborn. Present. Councillor Stephen Woodliffe. Present. Um, also attending our uh, portfolio holders, um, Councillor Yvonne Stevens. Present. And Councillor um, Nigel Walton. Present. Thank you. We also have non-committee members uh, attending, uh, councillors Frank Pickett, Alison Austin uh, and Peter Bedford uh, is also uh, present for the presentation. Um, the officers present, if they could confirm their attendance, uh, Christian Allen, the Assistant Director for Regulation and Lead Officer for this committee. Good evening, members. Um, Mike Gildersleeves, Assistant Director, Planning. Good evening, members. Um, and myself, Jeanette Collier, Senior Democratic Services Officer. Um, and uh, also we have a guest, uh, Mr. Gary Bowers, uh, on behalf of the, the Boston Alternative Energy Facility, who I understand is the Environmental Impact Assessment Project Manager for Royal Haskening. Um, Good evening, if you everybody. Could confirm yes. you are present, Mr. Yes, Bowers. I'm present. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Jeanette. That, that will, we'll now move to part one of this evening's agenda and address the preliminary um, items. Uh, the first one is to receive apologies for absence and notification of any substitute members. Uh, yes, Madam Chairman, I've received apologies from Councillor Peter Bedford as he's only able to, uh, to stay in the meeting for the presentation. And I've received notice that Councillor Stephen Woodliffe is here in his place as his substitute. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, the item two is to sign the minutes of the last meeting held on the 14th of March, 2020. Um, if any member wishes to, to comment on the accuracy of the minutes, could you please do so now? Nobody's indicating, Madam Chairman, that they wish to comment on the accuracy of the minute. Okay, so I'll take it as there are no comments. Um, I'll have your agreement to sign the minute. Thank you. Uh, the third item is to receive declarations of interest in respect of any item on this agenda. Nobody's indicating, Madam Chairman. Fine, thank you. And item four is to answer any written public questions. Are there any, Jeanette? Uh, there are none, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much. That concludes the preliminary items and we'll now move into part two of the agenda for this meeting, which is a one item agenda. I would like to welcome and invite uh, Mr. Gary Bowers to present his report. And once the presentation is complete, I will then open the meeting up for debate. Thank you very much. Okay, so what I'm gonna try and do is take control, uh, share my screen. I've got a um, PowerPoint presentation um, to deliver. Uh, given the number of people on, on the call as, as indicated by Madam Chairman, I think it would be good, best for questions to be retained until the end, um, but um, I will uh, now run through. So just give me two seconds to, um, oh, I haven't got screen sharing um, capabilities. Is there any way that can be given? Gary, if you control that, please. 
right, there we go. There we go, fantastic. Right, screen two. Okay, it should go. And right, can um, someone just give me the um, a shout when they can see their presentation? Yes. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, so um, this is uh, an update um, on the progress of the Boston Alternative Energy Facility project um, that is in um, the pre-application phase um, um, before the submission of the consent application to the planning inspectorate. What I propose to do today is to go through um, several discussion points. Um, the project um, went into a pause um, last October to sort of November-ish um, and I want to discuss the reasons for the project sort of going on hold. And then as subsequently, the project has picked up with a, a variation to um, some of the technology and some of the uh, approaches to um, various aspects of construction. Um, so the aspects of discussion um, that I'll go through with you tonight are changes to the proposed construction, um, changes to the supply of RDF, which is refuse derived fuel, changes to how that refuse derived fuel will be handled in terms of offloading and storage at the facility. Um, changes from the previous scheme, which we um, originally consulted on um, around this time last year um, for pre-processing of the refuse derived fuel and the thermal technology changes that we've, we've brought in. And then there's one or two other changes that we've um, discussed um, with regards to increasing the amount of carbon dioxide that we can capture through the facility and then what impacts that we've had in terms of um, discussions of, on consultation of the proposed changes and timescales and proposals for delivery of the actual um, consent application. So before I launch into the, um, the next slides, um, the, main, the main point of change was um, identified at around about October last year when the applicant um, for the proposed facility became aware that um, the, 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 the major technology provider um, was for what's called a gasification um, based um, technology and the gasification part would be the bit that converts the, the waste into energy. So the, the proposed gasification technology provider at that point last year announced that they were divesting their business and that the gasification part of their business would be one of the bits that were being um, split off from their, um, from their provision. So from, a, from a, a project perspective and a bankability perspective, that um, brought significant risks to the project to try and pursue um, that uh, line of technology um, with the same provider at the same time as divest, uh, divestment um, processes. So what the applicant looked for were alternatives in the uh, gasification technology to try and um, replace the, the, the technology that we wanted to uh, originally use uh, with an alternative gasification supply. Um, following that search, um, there were no um, technology providers who were willing to um, identify and put forward their technology at the level of power generation that this facility wanted to deliver. So that then um, meant that the applicant was forced to look um, for other potential um, technologies that could deliver power by, um, by um, using waste as a fuel source or rec recovering um, power from waste. Um, so that led down the path of more conventional energy from waste um, technology, using technology that's already um, used across the UK and globally at a scale that we um, wanted to use in the proposed facility. So not only does that sort of answer some um, previous concerns that residents had about um, the, the de degree of power output that the gasification facility would propose um, and in that the project couldn't really demonstrate any exemplar um, schemes that were operating at the same power level using gasification technology. So it, it, by moving to more conventional and readily available and used um, energy from waste technology, we're now able to identify comparator um, schemes and facilities that are already running in across the UK and globally. But also from a project perspective, it meant that we were um, using potentially a lot more bankable technology. So from a, um, from a 
project investment perspective, it makes it far more attractive to um, the backers of the, of the scheme and the investors in the scheme. So, and as this scheme has been entirely funded out of um, private finance, there's no public funding um, at, at all associated with this scheme. So that meant that um, the bankers and, the, um, and the, the funding package providers would have a lot more assurances about the performance guarantees associated with their scheme. Um, and I should make it reasonably clear at this point, moving forward, in case there are any questions on that issue, is that I really don't have much knowledge about the financing of this project. My, my involvement is, is purely on the um, envir environmental impact assessment and pulling together the package of information required to submit the development consent order application. So when I, if I lapse into, into abbreviations um, and say DCO, that means the development consent order application. And also by way of explanation at this point, in case um, we've got some um, new listeners to the um, about the project, this project is what's considered to be a nationally significant infrastructure project, which means that the application for consent is not determined at a at a, a local planning authority level. It's determined by the Secretary of State. So we have to prepare a package of information called a development consent order application that will be submitted to the planning inspectorate, who will then assess and make recommendations to the Secretary of State um, throughout the um, consent determination process, which will follow our application. So that's um, a little bit of a history as to where we were from um, October-ish last, um, last year, um, moving from a, a gasification-based um, project towards a more conventional energy from waste um, based project. So when I say conventional energy from waste, I mean a combustion based technology rather than a gasification based technology. And I can sp explain what the differences between the two are um, later if, if that's required. So um, what I'll do now is move um, from that kind of introduction into um, sort of identification about where the project is. So just putting this into context, hopefully you can see my cursor. So Boston Town Centre is in the sort of north, um, sort of upper left-hand um, part of the screen. So Asda is, is here, station is here, and there are various aspects of, of Boston um, that you can see. So we're at the proposed facility is um, south of the town, south of um, the, the Haven or the River Witham, in this kind of field here. Um, and for those of you who have visited the, um, the new Household Waste Recycling Centre, if you can see my cursor, I'm just hovering it over the top of that facility there. That will give you an indication of, of where our facility is proposed to be. Um, next to our proposed facility, um, you'll possibly be aware that there is already a, um, a gasification facility that has been built. Um, it's close to um, completing on its um, uh, commissioning process as far as I'm aware. Um, our scheme has nothing to do with that facility, so we're not linked to that facility at all, um, just for, um, to make that clear in, um, in this, um, for this presentation perspective. So um, that's the, the position of the facility in the wider aspect of the town. And just to zoom in a little bit more, so here we, are, here we have the Riverside um, Industrial Estate. Uh, as I've said, this is the um, new household waste recycling facility. So we have several zones of our facility. So the, the zone in red here will be where the main thermal combustion process will be located. Um, the orange areas here are where we are proposing to use as lay down for construction purposes. So this is where all the materials will be received and, and stored. And we will have what's called a construction village, i.e. where all the contractors and, uh, and the construction site workers will be um, based in terms of office and, uh, and, and port cabin type use will be in this, this, this area here. And the green area here um, will be the wharf. Uh, construction of the wharf area. So you can see a, a reasonably long wharf um, aspect frontage. And then the blue area here, which we'll talk about slightly later on is where we're proposing to make lightweight aggregate um, from the ash residues that um, result from the um, combustion process. We'll also um, be using this, this area here as well as part of our, um, part of our process. So that's the kind of site location as to where the facility is. And if you forgive a very complex looking diagram, 
this is actually um, a general, what's called a general arrangement drawing. So it shows the actual layout of the facility on that site I've just shown you. It's slightly, it's, it's north as you can see is, is pointing to the right. So if you can sort of just twist your head slightly, you'll get an idea of north to south. Um, the river is here. So this is where the, uh, the river is. And what I propose to do is to just run through the changes in various sections referring to this plan um, about what the new, new um, proposed scheme is, is going to be compared to the old one. And what that will do is allow us to discuss um, where we've made some project changes and what the potential impacts of those changes are going to be. So just running through this, um, to put this into context, so we have here, this is the um, this is the river. We have three birthing points. So you can see the ships identified in light blue with crane at, um, aspects on, on each of the birthing points. So the wharf will, um, the proposed wharf will run from roughly where my cursor is, which I hope you can see here, all the way down to this point here. And it'll be about a 400 meter stretch. So this will be an elevated wharf. And that wharf will form the um, primary flood defence line. So we're working um, with the Environment Agency to maintain um, the flood defence aspect or, uh, in terms of flood protection and the future protection plan, flood protection plan for Boston. So we're working with the Environment Agency and they've identified that the wharf flood defence line here should be 7.2 metres above ordnance datum. And we will tie that into the existing flood defences um, as part of the construction of the wharf to maintain flood protection of the area. So the area behind this wharf is lower than the actual um, wharf level. And that offers some degree of protection um, from, um, um, to, the, to the river from um, activities that are going on behind the wharf. So you can see the, the red line identifies our proposed site boundary. So we have a, a relatively tight boundary running around um, the site. And this kind of, this area here where I'm sort of, uh, sorry, my, my fault. Um, is where, uh, this is where Mick George um, currently has uh, a site and that's outside of our boundary. So essentially there is an island um, um, sort of within our boundary that um, we are not um, proposing to use. So as you can see here, not within our site development. So this is the wharf area. This is a temporary um, contingency storage area for bales. The green and blue lines are conveyors that take bales from the wharf to the main um, processing. So here we have a, a bale splitter, a bunker, and then we've got these three units here, which represent the actual thermal treatment process. So the combustion process. And then um, leading on from those, we have turbine building. And then this building here is called an air cool condenser. And if anyone's driven up the, up the A1 past Ferry Bridge, um, air cool condensers used to be massive conical um, concrete towers. And what they do is cool, um, cool the air from this process to ensure that there's not big clouds of water vapor. Uh, they're now represented by modern boxes uh, on stilts with fans. Um, our, the bottom part of the site here is uh, the substation where we are connecting directly into the grid and we're connecting directly into this, this little square on that black line here. This is the 132 kilovolt um, line that runs um, north to south um, in, uh, from Boston. So that we will tap directly into that, um, sub, into that from that substation here into that um, power line without having to create an offsite um, cable route, um, say to Bicker or another substation. So then the ash that is, pro, is, is created by this facility will be ground down in this building here. And then we will send it to this plant here. And what this plant does is here, this is a big kiln essentially, or four big kilns that will create lightweight aggregate out of the um, proposed, the ash that comes from this facility. And then there are ancillary structures around here um, on, in terms of Mo mobile plant park as, that, has ident that I've identified previously. So that is kind of the, um, the layout of the proposed um, facility. So what I'll do now is just talk about how we've changed to this layout from um, what was proposed um, um, as part of our um, previous work last year. So one of the um, 
things that we were uh, conscious of as part of the um, environmental impact assessment was the number of vehicle movements that were visiting the site during construction and um, during operation. So the main requirements during construction um, were huge amounts of concrete that would be required um, as, as part of the construction of the overall foundations for the um, proposed facility, but also for construction of various structures. So one of those structures um, was a series of um, silos that we were going to um, use to store the um, processed RDF, um, refuse derived fuel, after it had been through a processing facility. Um, for reasons I'll explain um, later on in the presentation, we don't need that processing facility. Um, but one of the key things in terms of the original um, plans was that a, a very large number of um, concrete deliveries would be required and cement deliveries would be required. And these were contributing to some quite high vehicle numbers during the construction phase. So what we wanted to do was to look at ways of reducing the amount of um, vehicle numbers that would be visiting the site um, during the construction process. And we did that in two ways. The first way was to actually have, um, think about creating the ability to manufacture concrete on site. So putting a concrete batching plant on site during the um, construction process. And the reason for that is it's easier to supply the raw materials for manufacture of concrete in bulk rather than have deliveries in um, cement lor mixer lorries, um, which um, and we can make quite considerable vehicle uh, number savings as a consequence of that. But the second um, part was to construct um, some of the wharf, uh, the wharf earlier than uh, we anticipated in the um, original um, project and allow the receipt of materials during construction by ship. So under the previous um, scheme, we did not have any um, deliveries by ship during the construction phase directly to the site. So what that means is we can, we can then ship in, in great bulk quantities. So using um, up to two and a half thousand ton ships and we can supply um, raw materials for concrete um, directly by ship to the site. And thus again, say making saves savings on the amount of vehicle uh, movements during construction. So all of these were, were ideas than, from comments that were um, raised to us by residents and other stakeholders about potential impacts associated with vehicle movements during the construction phase. So the likely effect of um, those um, plans on site by having um, an on site batching plan and also um, the use of um, a deliveries by ship would be that there will be reduction to construction traffic. However, we will, um, what we ha have identified is that we previously weren't um, using ship movements during construction. So that is now introducing um, ship movements during that phase. So at the moment, we're working on the impact assessments for, um, for the scheme. And um, hopefully within, um, we've got a, a, a delivery plan of um, in the next sort of two to three weeks, we should have the um, outcomes of that impact assessment in terms of reductions on um, to construction traffic. And we will be able to share the um, findings of, the, of those assessments with, um, with, with the council and other stakeholders. Um, so what has changed, obviously, uh, we're anticipating a significant reduction to construction traffic, um, but an increase in ship movements during the construction phase. What hasn't changed are the type and amount of mobile plant and equipment that we're anticipating on site during construction, other than the batching plant, and the approximate length of construction of up to four years, um, which includes um, the actual commissioning of the um, uh, each the facility once built is, is not going to um, change. So um, in terms of uh, refuse derived fuel supply, um, one of the other um, aspects of change to the project was our original um, supplier, which was a company called NMP Recycling, um, one of the UK's um, premier suppliers of refuse derived fuel, um, wanted to focus their business more on a, a more refined fuel source and fuel supply. Um, and that was a, a fuel supply called Semcoal, which is used to um, essentially work in uh, 
thermal processes that require a higher calorific value than um, conventional refuse derived fuel. So that meant we, uh, the, the applicant needed to source a, another supplier of refuse derived fuel and was engaged with a company called TOTUS. And again, TOTUS are one of the UK's premier suppliers of refuse derived fuel, but they have a wider distribution network um, than the previous um, supplier. So we have identified a wider number of ships, uh, sorry, a, sorry a, a wider number of potential um, port destination, um, sub, uh, port departure points across the UK um, that can supply the facilities, uh, facility with the refuse derived fuel. So we're looking at uh, potentially up to 12 different ports uh, across the UK, whereas previously we were only looking at around about three or four. Um, and also as a, as a consequence of the change to um, energy from waste, combustion-based energy from waste from gasification, we're also able to reduce the uh, worst case amount of supply down. And the reason for that is because energy from waste is to put it uh, simply less fussy about the material that it um, takes in. So under the gasification um, based project that we had last year, we had a large um, processing facility that was um, included on the site. And what that processing facility was doing was taking the refuse derived fuel and then separating out uh, materials such as metals and um, inert material like glass and stones and separating that out from the, um, from the more biogenic or biodegradable material um, or organic containing material um, in the refuse derived fuel. And that would then leave um, just a more pure um, feedstock after that processing with less than 1% of any contamination um, of anything that was, was, was metal or um, inert stone type um, base. And that was the material that would then be stored in the silos and then fed into the gasification. And that was because of its intolerance to any um, um, sort of con contraries or um, residues of those types of materials in that feedstock. So the energy from waste facility um, that uh, experiences as has, has given m many operators across the UK uh, on the basis of their current operations and the market knows that uh, an energy from waste facility does not need that pre-processing um, upfront to um, process the fuel. And because of that, we're now able to reduce the potential uh, worst case maximum supply of material from a figure of 1.5 million tonnes per annum, which is a figure we derived after the submission of the preliminary environmental information report. Um, in that report, we were anticipating a 1.3 million tonnes, but um, following that submission, we, we did a bit more research and identified that it would be likely to be a 1.5 million ton worst case. Uh, we're now able to reduce that to 1.2 million tons as a worst case um, to ensure that we're reducing the number of ships that there will be delivering that refuse derived fuel in the operation phase. So we are anticipating um, fewer ships um, in the operational phase. Next. Um, Slide is, um, excuse me, I'm going to cough. Just give me one second. No, I've managed to hold it off. Um, so the, um, the refuse derived fuel handling um, uh, has changed as well. So um, previously we had um, a scheme that was looking to use three mobile cranes um, for handling refuse derived fuel across the two berths. So they'll be able to what so one crane would be essentially be able to move between um, between the two berths according to um, where it was required. Um, we've we've identified that um, to facilitate a greater pace of unloading of the refuse derived fuel, we're going to ensure that there will be two cranes at both berths. So we have uh, four cranes in total. And um, what that will mean is that we'll be able to remove material um, quicker. Um, if we have two but two ships um, docked at their berth um, at the same time. The other major change that we have looked to do is to avoid double handling um, of the uh, bales of RDF. So just to make it clear, um, when the material is sent to the facility, um, they come in tightly wrapped sort of square or rectangular brick shaped bales. The bales weigh roughly one to 1.2 tons each and slightly larger than conventional hay bales. 
So they're tightly wrapped in plastic to ensure the material um, can't escape. The previous scheme, which is represented in the bottom right-hand corner here of that slide, would be to offload um, the bales from the ship and load them onto trailers. The trailers would then drive from the, um, off, the, off the main wharf down into a big storage area and the bales would then be loaded into a, into a stockpile um, and then um, to, uh, as part of the offloading of a complete ship. And then as part of a first in, first out principle, the bales would be then loaded back from a stockpile onto a conveyor and taken to the refuse derived fuel processing building. So what that introduced was quite a lot of double handling and a lot of operator involvement in, in, in using trailers and mobile cranes. So what we're proposing in the new scheme is to have um, the bales will be offloaded from the, from the ship and go directly onto a conveyor. The conveyor will then take the bales straight to the, the bale splitting plant, which is just a, a, a crude shredder and then be opened up into a bunker. And what that means that we're reducing the double handling element. However, there will still be some element of re requirement to store outside, um, which is where this, um, this, this area was here, when the bunker is full. So we've got approximately four days worth of storage in that bunker, um, whereas previously we had four days of storage outside. The anticipation is that the bales will not be stored outside for any longer than, um, than three to five days. Um, to ensure that they're, they're, they are um, moved on, a, on, a, on an agile perspective. And what we're also planning to do is to use more automated systems for removing bales from the, um, from the stockpiles. And what that will, will mean is you, uh, reducing potential accidents from operator fatigue, from, um, from operating cranes and, and um, trailers and mobile cranes down in the storage area. So that will um, increase the safety potential in operation of the facility. Um, what we've also done as a, as a subtle change here, which um, you may be able to pick up, if you look at the boundary of the facility, we've got a slightly extended boundary um, that we had previously. However, we've been discussing with um, Anglian Water, um, the, the, there's a sewage line that runs across the river. So if you look at the, this small circle here, um, we've brought the red line of the boundary, the order limit boundary inside that sewer line so that at no point do Anglian water have to come onto the site to, um, if they are required to do any maintenance of that um, sewage line. So overall, what this has done is mean, uh, meant that we've got a more efficient operation in terms of bale handling, the less potential for, uh, and less potential for accidents. And we're able to offload bales from the ships um, in a more st um, speedy manner. Um, However, they, um, from, a, from a birth pocket perspective, what um, is not particularly clear from this diagram, but um, the, the actual line of the, um, the river, um, the mean high water spring, so the high tide line currently is actually where this red line is. So what we are proposing to do is to cut back, if you've ever been down this, um, this path, we've cut, we're cutting back towards that um, flood defense line which, which exists currently to create what's called a birthing pocket so that when ships are birthed at this current facility, they're not going to hinder any passing traffic um, that is using the river. So we're not inhibiting the, the fishermen or any other commercial traffic visiting the port whilst we have a, a vessel that is docked at our uh, birthing point. And just while we're talking on that subject for clarity, so we've been um, discussing the uh, navigation issues with the Port of Boston and the, the Port of Boston um, have identified that, the, that the, the, to turn these vessels, we will either use what's called the knuckle point, which is a point um, that boats can anchor to and then use thrusters to turn um, outside the port um, wet dock, or we can actually use the port wet dock for turning vessels because there is no um, space to turn the vessels at the, at the current uh, wharf point here. So we don't want to um, in, hinder traffic. So we're working with the port and other river users to develop a navigation risk assessment and the navigation aspects and river aspects form part of the environmental impact assessment that we're carrying out. 
So in terms of pre-processing, I've mentioned this already, but um, the bottom um, plan here shows a previous pre-processing building that we um, had on site to essentially shred the bales of uh, refuse derived fuel as they come in. We had eight shredders, each one of those shredders was about um, 75 tons each, this green, the green part here. And they had a line taking the material um, outwards to the uh, width, um, perimeter of the building and, and uh, as that material progressed, it would be finely shredded. Uh, metals would be taken out of it, both ferrous and non-ferrous metals separately. And any inert material would also be taken out uh, of this um, of the waste stream here. It would then get taken, the shredded uh, material would then get stored in the silos. There were six silos proposed. Each of those silos has, had a capacity of 48,000 cubic meters. So they were very big. So if you've ever been to um, driven down past the co-op near the Boston College and looked to your right as you're um, passing, there are six kind of grain silos at the back of the port. Um, we're talking each one of those silos would be equivalent to, to that, uh, the silos that are at the port, but these were made from slip form concrete rather than the metal clad um, um, silos that the port have. So in our proposed facility, we don't need this building. Uh, for reference, this building this part of the building here was about 160 meters, uh, sorry, 140 meters by 95 meters. So this represents quite a considerable footprint. And as I've said, each of these silos, 48,000 cubic meters, each silo was 25 meters in diameter. So by removing this facility, we've created quite a lot of space um, on the site and that's afforded us some quite considerable advantages which I'll discuss in a second in terms of how the site is laid out and what opportunities that has delivered for the project in terms of um, adding in f additional features that we couldn't previously involve. So the new facility here I've tried to make this space uh, around about the same size as this space so from a scaling perspective you can see we've moved this part of the facility quite further up into the, um, into the body of the area. And as a consequence of removing the, um, the um, silos, we've reduced the, um, as I mentioned earlier, the requirements for con con that huge amount of concrete that would be required to construct a, a 25 meter diameter, 30 meter tall silo and six of those out of concrete. The other um, issue in terms of, um, of impact on um, transport numbers was the actual pre-processing of the refuse derived fuel at this point here under the previous scheme uh, led to approximately 300,000 tonnes of material being segregated out um, that would be required to be transported from the site and out into the um, um, regional recycling network. The fact that we're now only um, shredding bales open and, and tipping into a bunker and only taking out uh, massive particles at that point means that we're not um, going to need the vehicle numbers for transporting that 300,000 tons. So what we are, um, what we are relying on is that uh, this will also, sorry, we're not relying on uh, the observation we have at this point is that this will also reduce um, significant um, vehicle numbers during the operational phase as well. So um, what we're moving on to now is the thermal treatment um, differences. So what you can see from above, which is the new scheme and compare that to um, below, which was the old scheme at this point last year, we now have a scheme which is much more um, spread out. Um, and this is going to allow a much greater degree of um, efficiencies during both the construction phase and, and how the facility operates because here, if you can look at the, the bottom side under the gasification plant, we have this building here, which with, with, a, with the three sort of staggered red um, features here, this was the turbine building. So what we're having to do here is, is have several kinks in the pipe work to get the steam from the, uh, that's generated by the gasification facility to the, um, to the turbines. And then uh, a degree of traversing from the, that turbine point to the um, to the substation for delivery of the power. What we've now got is a much more linear scheme, where the the, the EFW EFW units are feeding into the the turbine units that are feeding into the air cool condenser, and then to the um, to the substation. 
So it's made the layout a lot more efficient. And obviously that will mean from, an, uh, from a construction perspective that it's much safer to build. What we're also um, looking at here as well is because we've uh, made savings on site, we're able to reduce the actual area um, that the project will take. So if you compare um, this, looking at this field here in the bottom part of the site, we were taking the whole of that bottom field uh, as part of our previous development. What we're doing now here is we can, as you can see, most of that field now is going to be outside of our boundary. We don't need that additional space here. So we're not going to be taking that part of the, of the land and we're keeping the boundary tight to the outputs of the, uh, to, the, um, to the outside of the development. What we also have is uh, this space here, which we are um, now able to use for um, landscape screening uh, and potential um, noise bund um, uh, construction. So we can more effectively screen um, the facility from, um, from the residential receptors that are sort of to the west of the facility. Um, and the, also the, the layout has meant that um, we've been able to move some of the um, aspects of the facility that um, into the center of the site, which, which potential had potential to cause uh, noise. So we're also uh, have, have the potential to reduce noise impacts by moving these aspects, um, these features away from, uh, further away from residential receptors. So as you can see the, the, the scale, uh, this air cool condenser, which is essentially a, a set of fans has moved, um, moved away, so moved eastwards away from um, residential receptors. So in terms of um, processing, the, the fact that we're not taking out uh, materials at the front end of this process means that we're going to get more ash at the back end of the process. So we've introduced a, a facility that will process the ash and grind it down into small particles. And then that will go out to the um, lightweight aggregate facility. So we're going to increase the um, quantity of ash that we're going to produce, which will then mean that there will be an increase in the amount of aggregate product that the facility will produce. So there will be a slight increase as well in terms of the number of ships required to remove that um, aggregate from the facility. So just to put that into perspective, we are moving all of the, delivering all of the materials into site by ship and we're deliver, exporting all of the product aggregate by ship. But we're anticipating that there will be a net reduction overall in the number of ships that are required to visit the facility in the operational phase. And the final change that has been um, made to the scheme um, is the amount of uh, carbon dioxide that can be captured um, from the facility. So this blue square here um, in, the, in the old facility, we had one carbon dioxide unit here and now we've got two units. So we're, we're increasing the number of uh, the amount of carbon dioxide that can be captured from the exhaust gases of the, um, of the energy from waste plant. One very important point um, to make, um, we've had some concerns raised by residents during the, um, the, con the, the consultation that we've run so far about you moving from what's perceived to be a cleaner gasification scheme to a dirty um, incineration or combustion scheme, it's really important to note that both of these facilities have to comply with exactly the same emission standards. So when we issued our um, preliminary environmental report at this point last year, there was a set of standards in place. Um, those standards have been replaced by a new more strict set of standards in December 2019. So we are having um, to identify um, with the technology provider that this um, and demonstrate that this facility can comply with those new emission standards that were impl uh, implemented in December 2019. Those standards will be exactly the same for a gasification facility. So this facility is no worse um, than a, a gasification facility. So in terms of visual, uh, what the facility um, could look like, and this also has some potential impact. This is the facility that you can see if you're standing outside of the, um, the current um, household waste recycling facility, that's the gasification facility. Uh, as you can see, it's quite open in its construction. The um, technology provider for, um, for the, um, the proposed combustion-based EFW scheme that we're looking to use 
prefers in, in Northern Hemisphere construction, a more clad um, building. So as you can see, um, this is an example of one of their plants. I think this is in Germany. Um, so the facilities is more likely to be more clad um, than, the, um, than the previous um, gasification technology provider. And that will also have some impact on the degree of uh, noise emission. Um, so to, the cladding will act to reduce potential noise impacts from the processes that are going on within the, um, the, the, uh, the boiler and the steam generation within that um, facility. So that will have some impact on um, potentially reducing noise. But obviously, this will make it a little bit more boxy. And, and the fact that is that the, the EFW facility is also fractionally taller than the um, gasification facility. So we're looking at a, a height increase of approximately um, sort of um, between four and six meters. So what we're doing as part of that is to reassessing the impacts on the landscape and the visual impacts of the facility as part of our ongoing environmental impact assessment process. And then finally, um, as you, uh, uh, as you may be aware, if, if you've walked down here, there is a, there is a footpath um, that uh, if, hopefully you can see on the, 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 the image, uh, the Google Earth image on the, on the bottom right here. If you follow that line of, of bushes and shrubs, um, that is a footpath. Oh, sorry, I clicked again. So that is a footpath that, um, that runs from, um, from, no from north of the Haven, just outside the, um, the port entrance on this side of the, um, the river. And what, the, what uh, we understand is that that footpath represents the line of the, the original line of the river before the river Witham was canalized into the, uh, into the, uh, into the Haven in, in the early 19th century. Um, this, um, this is a, a slightly raised embankment, which is slightly um, shorter in height than the primary flood defence um, that fronts the um, the river. And what um, what the uh, this bank um, affords is a um, is is a delineation between our site and the and the current McGeorge site. But what it also does, uh, there are certain gaps in this bank. This bank is not continuous, um, but it does represent a footpath. And in our original scheme. Um, that we had at this point last year, this gap here, which allows transition from the main thermal part of the facility into the lightweight aggregate part of the facility, was um, was an open open gap with a with a with a site road running between the two, um, and the conveyor system running along this edge here. So uh, under the original proposal, um, with this being a footpath. Um, there was a plan to have a secure crossing point here where pedestrians that were following this foot, footpath would actually have to cross the site. Um, now, this obviously raises several um, security and safety concerns. So what we're proposing to do is to build a footbridge um, between that gap that will span, um, span the, um, the section um, between that gap and allow pedestrians to continue along that footpath but not have to access any part of the site and keep the two distinct. So what we're doing is working with the um, heritage stakeholders about how um, how that facility will uh, that footpath will be designed, and obviously we're keen to um, to take on any um, comments or advice from um, from the council in terms of how that looks and how we can adapt that and, and fit that into the um, the character of um, the area and, and ensure that that footpath um, remains allows for safe passage of um, pedestrians and sort of. They're moving into consultation. So um, these um, changes were um, were being worked on quite um, quite um, rigorously between the um, end of last year towards um, the the end of June this year, and at the, at, towards the end of June we became aware of what the final aspects of the scheme were uh, were going to be. Um, in the interim period, um, all of the work was being done by the applicant in terms of um, the um, confirming um, new the, the, these changes to the scheme that I've just described and the, all of the environment work um, with all stakeholders and communications with all stakers were instructed by the applicant to go on hold. So there was no work or communication um, um, on instruction from the client coming out of the, um, the delivery of the development consent order and the environmental impact team to, to stakeholders of that time until all of these changes were confirmed. 
So once we got that um, confirmation, we then went to the planning inspector to our, seek advice on how we should then communicate. Um, and we um, advised, were advised by the planning inspectorate that we needed to consult with the, with the key stakeholders to the scheme, but also um, in, in identify how we were going to um, interact with the members of the public. So what we what we identified with uh, with um, uh, in early discussions with the council and uh, other stakeholders that would would be that we would have a um, a 28 day consultation period um, and that period was running from the uh, 10th of, of August and will close on the 10th of September so it's actually slightly over 28 days uh, which is a statutory minimum and um, we would consult as widely as possible given the restrictions that were imposed on um, such activities as um, 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 by the current COVID-19 pandemic. So we were unable to hold any public um, in engagement events. So we've, we've had previous to the change, three rounds of public consultation with, um, with members of the public in the, in the Boston area. Um, each of those have been at um, six um, locations. And um, obviously, given the current pandemic, we weren't able to hold face to face discussions with uh, with members of the public. So we identified in a newsletter and, and via a mail drop um, that we would have um, webinars that would be um, would be sort of able to promote and um, discuss and allow opportunity for members of the public to discuss um, concerns about the scheme. And at the same time, and, and prior to that as well, we've been having meetings and discussions by, via webinar with, with stakeholders um, uh, to uh, update in terms of changes um, of the scheme. So my final slide um, of the day of the evening is just to update you on timescales. So as we've identified in June, we confirmed the, the design freeze for the project. Um, we commenced um, the, um, the open consultation actually at the end. Of, so we prepared the consultations of um, in July. And what we um, identified was um, we didn't want the consultation period to start until the last newsletter was, uh, was posted. So we actually had a two week postage um, window that uh, ran up preceding the actual start of the consultation um, date. So in, in essence, some people had even um, longer over a week over the, um, the, the 10th, to, 10th of August to 10th of September consultation period to, to um, engage with the, um, with the project team. Um, so what we're doing at the moment is we're at the back end now of completing the environmental statement, which is the report that concludes the environmental impact assessment. So we are working on the final um, updates um, to that, what the impacts of these proposed um, changes are on the scheme. And we should have some information to be able to share with the stakeholders uh, at the end of um, September into early October. Um, and that's where we'll be able to identify what the um, impacts are with, re with regards to things like emissions, noise uh, and, um, and vehicle numbers and any other wider impacts that may occur on things like the wash and the uh, local nature reserve, the Haven, Havenside Nature Reserve. So those issues have been worked on now. We're looking to get those, as I've said, um, towards the end of September into, into October. So at, as, as it stands, we have then to uh, a period to review the uh, documents that go with that environmental statement to put that into a bundle that um, is, uh, meets the requirements for the planning inspectorate in terms of a development consent order submission. And that will then be submitted at the end of November. That's our current um, plan. Um, we're not anticipating that any um, third party comments uh, either from the public or stakeholders will, um, will impact the delay of that submission. So we're still working on that as our, um, as our key milestone for submission. So that um, sort of brings my um, presentation to a conclusion. So um, I'd be grateful if any, um, any members have any questions um, for, um, for me to, uh, to answer. Okay, yes, Jeanette. Madam Chairman, uh, Councillor Stevens, the portfolio holder has raised her hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so Councillor Stevens would like to. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Gary, nice to see you. Um, I've got one concern that I'd like clarify. Well, I've got a few questions, but a concern that I'd like clarification on, please. 
um, the overall percentage of the emissions that's coming out of the chimney, the CO2, what percentage is going to be captured and what percentage is going to go into the atmosphere? That's what I'd like clarification on. Um, the next thing, the river mud, um, is the river mud going to be used with the ash to make the aggregate? And thirdly, it's a, this has become more apparent this evening and I'm feeling a bit jittery about it because it doesn't seem like you're going to be taking the waste um, that we generate in Lincolnshire into the plant. It's all going to come by sea. Now, can Lincolnshire get its waste um, turned into energy through this plant? That's a question, especially if Mick George's um, area is free, that could become a bailing plant. So I'd like you to answer those three questions, please. Okay, yep, yeah, I'll answer in, um, in the order that was given. So forgive me, I'm, I'm, I don't have any support, so I'm having to write them down to make sure that we don't, I, one, I don't forget any questions, and two, that I've captured them. So um, it, um, for our consultation report, we can update with what questions with what uh, were, were asked. So in terms of um, percentage of CO2, so we have three lines um, of a uh, of thermal plant. Two of those lines will have a CO2 unit on them and one of them won't. So one of those lines, 100% of all of the emissions will, will, will go into the atmosphere without any carbon dioxide captured. And in the other two lines, each of those will have 12% of the CO2 um, that is um, part of the exhaust stream captured and turned into food grade carbon. So that's the answer to that question. Can I just come back there? Yep. If you can do two lines, why can't you do three lines? At the moment, we've got the um, the space for two lines, and that's the um, what we the client has to rely on. The applicant has to rely on is a um, a market for all of the CO2 that they can generate. So uh, we can't put in a unit to capture something with uh, on a speculative basis um, to capture CO2 that we can't actually distribute into the market. So that's what the the reason for two. But but when CO2 goes into the atmosphere. Um, we need clean air, we need a safe planet, and this is this is the bit that's making me jittery. Yeah. I think the um the the prospector of this plant needs to sharpen their pencil and think differently because we need to be looking after not only Boston but our planet. And this is the first jitter I've had. Now, I will support this, but I want confirmation that we are not going to be um, sending CO2 into the atmosphere, causing more problems. Because if that's going to happen, as portfolio holder, I will say no, I'm not happy to support it. Okay, that, so that's, that's, that's majorly, majorly important to me. It is, and that's majorly important to the applicant and also to be able to demonstrate that CO2 is part of um, a, a figure that's part of the emission limits. So the facility without the CO2 capture units will, will be compliant with the, the emission limits that um, are proposed in the, in, the, in the document that has been um, submitted for all schemes to have to be able to comply with um, under modern standards. So the, the addition of those CO2 capture units is making that facility um, better in that regard at capturing CO2 and putting it to good use. So it is, but it is a very, it is a very important point and a vital point. Well, I, I would really like confirmation that mm. the the, um, the prospector of this plant um, is prepared to uh, respect the planet, yeah. respect Boston, and have three captures. Um, because otherwise I would certainly be most unhappy. But I'll leave that with you, Gary. You can okay. come in due course, thank you. No, okay, so second question was about use of sediment from the river. Yes. So um, what? Um, so at the moment, uh, as far as we understand, the Port of Boston um, doesn't dredge the river at that point. 
um, and um, relies on opening the, there's a reliance on opening the sluice gates um, to, to wash sediment further downstream. As far as we're aware, they dredge at the S bend around Hub Holt, um, um, the Hub Holt um, pumping station to keep that aspect clear because the river slows down because it's on a, on a slight S bend there. So we, uh, when we're creating the, um, the birthing pocket, when we're gonna cut into the land, to create that kind of lay-by, in essence, um, in, in the river, we will be digging into the um, into the um, current embankment. And once we've created that birthing pocket, there will be a need and a requirement for the facility to maintain that, to keep that clear, and to stop that from um, from silting up. So we're proposing to use that sediment as part of the um, facility, um, as part of the binding agent for creation of the aggregate in the facility. Okay, thank you. Yep. And then the third question on local waste. So we've had um, discussions with um, Lincolnshire County Council, who are the Waste Disposal Authority, about um, the use of the, uh, the waste that currently goes into the Slippery Gout Transfer Station. So from Boston residents, um, from the Spalding residents and some residents in, um, in East Lindsay as well. Um, that waste currently goes to North Highcombe, uh, where there is an EFW facility generating energy from it and is subject to procurement rules at Lincolnshire County Council. So we've identified that our facility um, is able and willing to take that waste, subject to it being bailed, but the guarantee of that can't be um, delivered at this stage. So there's a willingness, I think, on both sides, but we can't guarantee it in our current application. So I think ongoing dialogue will be maintained with, um, with Lincolnshire County Council as a waste disposal authority to try and facilitate that that happening. I think it's important that um, Boston's waste um, isn't taken by road um, anywhere, especially if we've got this facility on site. I think it's also important that um, oh, I'm just losing my track of train of thought. Just um, sorry, I'll have to come back to it if I might because I've lost my train of thought. Okay. Yeah, but from our perspective, there's a willingness on the applicant to take that material and, and it makes absolute sense to do so. And I think that's, a, that's all we can say at the moment. I've come back to it. Uh, taking it by road is not good. Um, mm. And I think if we've got this facility on site, um, being part of the Lincolnshire Waste Partnership, um, I have said at that meeting, I think Lincolnshire should have a gold standard of looking after its own waste. And this is why I'm excited about this plant, providing the answers are how I would like to see them looking after Lincolnshire. But, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I think um, that uh, if we can't, if we can't, then we, we, we're missing a trick because we will be using roads um, and I think we need to, to take charge of our waste rather than on the Panorama programme, seeing it on some Turkish shore or in a, in a Turkish field with, with a Tesco bag. And I think, okay, other counties might be sending their waste away. And I'm sure in, in the scheme of it all, what I've followed it through, we are also quite likely doing the same. And this is where I've got a lot of confidence in you guys um, that you're going to stop this and we are going to be responsible for our own waste across the whole county, not just Boston, but the whole county. And this excites me. So Gary, don't disappoint me, please. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Jeanette, have we got any, who's next? Um, Councillor Watson. Okay, thank you. Good evening, thank you, and apologies, Madam Chair, for technical hitches uh, getting to this meeting. And thank you, Gary, for, <laughs> for a good presentation. Um, I have previously attended one of your presentations uh, when specifically you were uh, talking about the gasification plant and the gasification process. I'm intrigued to know, is there a direct comparison of emissions from 
a gasification method of generating power like this? And what is the difference between that or just simply, um, as you said, you know, a boiler principle that you're just simply burning all the rubbish, all the waste, and it is uh, essentially unprocessed. And I wouldn't mind knowing also, so what is the difference between the two methods? And uh, that would be, uh, what are the projections for this plant in, in, in its revised form now compared to the uh, estimate of emissions with the gasification plant, if you can? Okay. Yep. So because each facility is unique and bespoke and because of the variances in um, in the waste stream that each each type of facility are, um, are receiving uh, and until it's operating, we can't actually do a one to one comparison. So this this is why the um, emission standards are in place to ensure that anyone who is constructing those facilities has to be able to demonstrate that the technology that they're going to be using to process those, um, the, the emissions, the, the exhaust gases from either of those facilities meets relevant standards. And those standards are set at a European Commission level um, and they're not, they're not revised lightly. So the last set of standards was in 2006 and it's taken the European, and it's, it's on a science-based um, human health and environmental risk assessment basis that those emissions are levels are determined through uh, the experience of operating such facilities. And, and it is also fair to say that there are a lot more examples of um, EFW, combustion-based EFW schemes operating at the power and and input through, um, levels that, um, that the scheme is proposing to operate at compared to gasification schemes operating at a, a, at a level. So it, it's not really possible to, to demonstrate at, at a front end process, which is why the emission standards are in place. If I may, uh, Madam Chair, come back with, um, so you are saying to me, there is no actual estimate of how many tons of co2 will be emitted for this plant at this stage the um what we're, we're doing as part of the environmental environmental impact assessment is to identify all of the impacts ac according to human health and the environment and one of those um assessments is about the air quality and what that will do that assessment will identify um the amount of predicted co2 um, that will be generated through the um, as, as, as part of the um, operation of this facility on the basis of um, what we call reference conditions. So yes, we will be able to identify what the CO2 um, inputs are going to be and any particular contaminants of concern as they're referred to, um, we'll be able to identify what the potential impact of those are, not just on, on, on the human health aspects around Boston, but also the wider environmental impacts, because obviously Boston's a hugely important and fundamental aspect of the agricultural um, prosperity of the country. Um, and also benefits from having the wash, which is the most designated um, site in, uh, in UK waters um, close by. So all of the impacts on air quality will, uh, on those receptors will be uh, assessed. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Um, yeah, who's next? Uh, Chairman, um, Councillor Stephen Woodlip has raised his hand using the raising hand facility, but Councillor Welb, I'm not sure who was first, whether Councillor Wellborn raised her actual hand <laughs> before Councillor Woodlip. Uh, I think Councillor Wellborn did raise her hand quite early. Um, uh, Councillor Woodlip, is it all right if Councillor Wellborn goes first? Yes, by all means, by all means. I'll wait. <laughs> Thank you, very sure. Thank you, Councillor Woodliffe. Uh, thank you, Gary, for the presentation. Um, one point I was taken when Yvonne was talking, Councillor Stevens, um, I understand that planting trees and vegetation actually combats the CO2 emissions. Now, I understand on the plan that as the boundary goes, they will be planting shrubbery or some sort. So surely this will help combat a lot of the CO2 emissions that obviously will have to come from this. Um, I don't know if this is something um, Gary knows and has considered or the yep. is in the plan at all. 
Uh, yes, it is. Um, so as part of the landscape and visual assessment and where one of the other aspects of the um, our environmental impact assessment, not only looking at what the facility looks like, but also tying it into a, the local character of the land, but also landscape and visual ties in quite closely with what we, we, we're doing from a, a land based ecology perspective. So as those two sort of assessments will overlap each other in terms of identifying um, biodiversity um, improvements around the site, but also any potential aspects for those, both visual screening via use of trees and also the impacts of, of, of potential screening on, um, on other emissions. So it is part of our assessment. Thank you. Can I have one more statement? Yes, um, basically, it's the wharf where you're going to cut in. Um, now I understand that this will impact greatly on the water flow down the haven um, and having talked to several people this will actually be very good for the town because it will maintain a stable water flow through the haven to the Witham and basically we, we wouldn't see as much of the mud that people hate so and I understand you're going to use the mud because you're going to have to keep doing it on a, a constant basis so it will actually benefit the town and the area um, to make it look a lot nicer than what it does now. And I think that that can only be good for the town. So thank you very much. Okay, and just uh, just on that point, there are um, one again another topic of consideration as part of our environmental impact assessment is what's uh, what's called sediment processes and how the uh, impact of constructing our um, our um, birthing pocket will impact on sediment flow uh, and also the water quality um, through the um, through the Witham and uh, into the from our point um, into the into the wash so it is an important part of our uh, of our investigation work. Thank you. Okay thanks very much Councillor Wobham. Councillor Wardley. Thank you Madam Chairman. You're welcome. Um, Thank you. Um, yes, Gary. Thank you very much for um, your your interesting uh, um, preview of what's what's involved. But I, I'm I've got a lot of questions about this project, really. And I, I don't think the location is appropriate. It seems to me to be very close to residential areas on the other side of the river. What I'm concerned about is the plume from the chimneys, uh, <clears throat> the southwest and northeast directions are the prevailing wind directions. So any plume from the chimney or chimneys will affect Wibberton and Fishtoft. Anybody living in Fishtoft and Wibberton, watch out. And of course, this could impact upon people's house pri prices and other issues, maybe like tourism. I am particularly concerned about the pollution and odor side of things. And I'd be interested to see what information you can supply on the mapping of the plume of the gas emissions from the chimneys. Now, these chimneys are 70 meters high, as I understand. So they're pretty high. And obviously the intention is that uh, any products from the chimneys will actually escape well outside Boston, but there's no guarantee of that. If you look at the um, information on plumes, and I've looked at a bit of it, it's quite complicated. Um, sometimes in certain weather conditions, the products can go straight down and uh, Councillor um, Stevens has mentioned carbon dioxide, which is, of course, very prominent. Everybody knows about carbon dioxide, but there are other things which are more potent than carbon dioxide. And obviously, it's a very serious issue. We reckon about probably from a ton of waste, you'll probably get about maybe two, three hundred kilograms of carbon dioxide. I think that's something on the conservative side. Some people say it's a lot higher. The products from burning could well be carbon monoxide, poisonous, sulfur dioxide, poisonous, nitrous oxide, poisonous, nitrogen dioxide, not very good for you, ammonia, nitrous oxide, and they're just a few. So I'm, I'm, you've explained to us how you're going to deal with the carbon dioxide, but what are you going to do with the other chemical, other products that come off? I wrote, I wrote to um, one of your colleagues, actually, it's, um, Maddie, Os Maddie Astill, I think her name is, BAF account executive, and she wrote back to me and said, you are absolutely right that the combustion process will mean that chemicals will be present in exhaust gases. No thermal treatment facility 
can prevent emissions. The question is, of course, what chemicals and what exhaustless gases will be present and what do you propose to do about it? Because if there's an emission, significant amount of um, to toxic gases from the chimneys and the appropriate wind is blowing, we might find that a lot of people who live in the Fishtoff area suddenly have a problem. I'll leave it at that point for, 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 for you, Gary, if you want to come back on those. Oh, and by the way, one other thing, actually, I would be interested in the, um, the mathematics that's been done with the plume. Yep. I'd imagine you, your people have used the Gaussian dispersion modeling um, of continuous buoyant air pollution plumes. I think that's the, that's the process that's used to calculate what happens. I'd be interested in some of their figures. And I'll leave it at that point, Madam Chairman. I think I've said too much anyway, haven't I? <laughs> uh, hopefully I've, um, I've made a note of all of the questions um, so I'll, I'll try and tick the, I'll try and tick them off one by one hopefully um, or at least provide a, um, a response to them one by one so first point was on location yeah um, so the um, the area of the Riverside Industrial Estate is identified in the uh, minerals and waste local plan and is allocated for uh, development of um, energy from waste and um, waste and other um, sorts of waste waste development. So that was an area that land is anticipated to um, to deliver facilities um, of this type. Um, hence, that was one of the um, the reasons why the the location was selected, along with the potential of a of a river um, uh, riverside berth and also the on site um, grid connection. Um, so for, um, that's that's kind of one of the at uh, the point for the location. Um, okay, several several questions about the plume. Um, so mm -hmm. as part of our, um, I'll, uh, um, I'll try and cover them all off. In terms of uh, our air quality assessment, which I mentioned earlier, this this is where we'll be, um, part of which will be the, um, the plume dynamics are covered in the air quality um, chapter. So we have scientists that are all uh, members of the Institute of Air Quality Management. And there is a recommended approach for modeling plumes from, um, from chimneys um, and how um, the impact and dispersion of those um, chimneys are going to be run. So we run a model. I can't for the life of me remember what that model's called, but um, I'll get back to you and identify what it is uh, to confirm what the, um, what the, what the mechanics are, um, are, um, are behind that model. Um, but what we are modeling is the impact of three um, three stacks from um, each of the each of the lines, emitting um, an exhaust at a at a certain velocity um, and and volume of, of contaminants um, that you've um, that you've identified. So they will be able to identify how the plume from each of those um, stacks interacts with each other and under um, both standard and worst case operating provisions, because the the, the model actually builds on. Um, on a worst case perspective, as well as a, what you could potentially call a blue sky perspective under, under normal operating conditions. And as part of that assessment, we use the wind rows um, and we don't just use one, um, one set of um, years worth of data, because if anyone knows this year has been, uh, the wind's been blowing oh. in the wrong direction. I, I, I run in cycle, so I know uh, when the wind's in the wrong direction, because it means I'm fighting against the wind running back than, um, than I am uh, rather than having it behind me. Um, but we take um, at five years worth of wind data to input into that model. And what that model also takes is all of the flat, bit, all of flat roofs and the associated buildings to identify how that, um, the different heights and gradients around the actual stacks will affect the, di uh, the dispersion of the plume. So it's a very complicated, complex model um, that we're doing, but following industry standard guidelines for this type of facility to identify how that plume is going to be dispersed. So that's um, the first point. Um, the second point, um, yes, there are a, a number of, um, of products of combustion um, that, identi that are emitted by um, facilities of this kind, as indeed there are from a car or a lorry or anything that operates under a combustion-based process. And if you look at the profile of an exhaust um, from a vehicle, um, you will see very similar um, contaminants that are uh, coming out. And as in the same way that vehicles have to operate to modern standards in terms of what they're permitted to um, emit before they're licensed to operate, uh, before they're allowed to be on the road under a, an MOT test, this facility will also have to demonstrate that all of those contaminants 
um, uh, are able to be complied with. And, and for something like um, dioxins, for instance, they're a, they're a, a potential um, product that is um, generated during incomplete conduction, uh, inc incomplete combustion, combustion. The level there is something like um, 0 0.06 of a nanogram per cubic meter of, of uh, exhaust emitted. So that's 11 zeros before you get to the six grams per cubic meter. So those standards are extremely stringent. So, and those standards, as I mentioned in the previous um, questions, have been set on the basis of science and um, from um, advisors to the European Commission across uh, all of the, UK, uh, the European member states about how um, impacts of um, emissions of, of various compounds have on human health and the environment. So they're set at a level which um, means that uh, as part of that following on from that statement that you can't guarantee that there is no, uh, there's, the, there are no chemicals that are being uh, emitted from any of these facilities, nor a car, nor anything else that burns something. These limits are set at levels that are not going to cause an unacceptable risk to, the hu to human health and the environment. And, the and as part of that work that we have to do, we have to demonstrate that that facility will be able to operate within those limits. Hence, um, we can't guarantee that the, uh, it's completely clean and it would be false of anybody to say that an exhaust from this type of facility or any other combustion-based um, principle um, has zero emissions. We are um, ensuring that the emissions are within acceptable standards. Um, I think, is there any other one other? Um, yeah, so I think that hopefully that's covered off um, covered off the points. But um, as I said, I'll, I can get back to you with uh, with the type of model that's used if um, if that's of interest. Yes, it would be. I'm not convinced by this. I mean, it's easy to say all these things. Yes. But once this place is built, you know, then whatever comes out that chimney comes out, and it's about how how you will be able to deal with this and many many others. We don't know what's in the feedstock, um, so you, you really don't know what's going to come out the chimney until it's come out, really. Yeah. It's not oh, like, all, well, all it's of, not like a, a power station that um, runs on, on uh, natural gas from, you know, North Sea gas. You know what's there. It's all methane, or 99.997% is methane. In this situation, your feedstock is, is, um, is a combination of whatever arrives on your doorstep. And yeah. you don't know what's in it. No, absolutely. Oh, and... Uh, we, yeah. Yeah, which is why all of these facilities have to have continuous monitoring um, when they're in operation. So each of those lines will have continuous monitoring of the exhaust gases that they um, that um, are emitted um, from the facility. And those, those ex um, monitoring systems are linked to the processes within the facility to, to be able to change various parameters, such as increasing some of the um, potential um, reagents that are put into the stream to be able to control various um, chemicals. Um, and then at the back end of the stream, we've got various processing that um, that the facility will have to be able to demonstrate is working at what's called the best available technology, which is as good as it can possibly be to ensure that the, those limits are not exceeded. So the system is capable of flexing in operation to the limits where it can detect potential elevations in certain parameters that, um, that are potentially increasing due to the um, supply. Yes, I think it sounds very good, but I'm, I'm not convinced. But, um, but I'd I like all the information. When you say, please send me all the information you can. Yeah. Maybe I'll, I'll change my mind at some point, but at this minute, not convinced. And this is a very large amount of, uh, of material going through here. It's not like linkage account accounts or 150,000 tons a year. You're maybe a million, maybe 1.2, maybe 1.4 million, we don't know. So it's a lot of, lot of material going through, 3,000 tons a day, basically. Yes, that's a correct. Stuff, a lot of stuff is going through this place. Yes, and um, who knows what's going to come out of the chimney? You're, hopefully, your systems will pick up the uh, hydrogen sulfide or whatever else comes out, or sulfur dioxide. But maybe they don't pick it up all of it or quick enough. As soon as the quantity that goes out could go straight over the top of Boston, the wind direction takes it straight over the town, over the schools. So I'm very concerned about this. I think the location is wrong. I understand why it's happened, but I think the location is wrong. If this was somewhere isolated, I'd have no problems. I'd accept it. But this is not, this is inside a town. And that's what worries me about this badly. Anyway, thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Gary, for your um, rendition. Send me all the information. I'm a mathematician. I enjoy okay. that. All right. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Yes. Thanks very much. Thank you, Madam You're Chairman. Welcome. You're welcome, Councillor Woodley. Christian, did you, you indicated you wanted to come in? Yeah. 
I was just trying to help Gary, really. I think the dispersion modelling is uh, ADMS. Is oh, yes. The, Thank yeah, ADMS dispersion modelling, I think, is the yeah. is the, the national model that's applied to model pollution emitted from stacks, I think, in all sorts yeah. of industries, and I think is the planning standard. So I hope that helps. But, but yeah, we are using industry in, industry standard um modeling to, to to work on that and our our team are very experienced in that Jeanette have you got uh, councillor Danny has uh, raised his hand and then uh, councillor Alison Austin as a non-committee member okay yeah councillor Danny if you'd like to yes thank you madam chairman thank you Gary for the presentation it's very interesting uh, we have been through one before, I think, in the committee rooms at the BBC and the Borough Council. Uh, I have few a few things which is I would like uh, more clarification on them. I, I, I mean, I will admit I'm a very humble and my knowledge very humble and I'm not physicist, you know. Uh, uh, so um, uh, the first thing which is attract my attention is the increase of the capture units from one to two, which is a good move. Uh, and that's just raised the question, why you have to do that? Is it because probably we didn't know how much CO2 will be dispersed in, in, in the air? That's one thing. I um, That's one thing. Secondly, I think the location, which is I agree with Councillor Woodliffe, is not right because in the town, and it's very close to schools, very close to a lot of amenities and to the surrounding villages. And I will just share an experience with you. I think in uh, 2002, 2003, uh, uh, more or less an ammoniac factory in the heart of Toulouse had some issues and had an explosion. And um, the debris flew from that place I think over three kilometers, which is probably 1.8 miles on the surrounding areas. And lots of houses were like completely damaged and the air was full of bad smell and um, bad air. And people did suffer from it. Some of them, they have to leave the town for, especially the people who lives close. So this is just from my experience. And I think this factor, this unit, it's, it's a huge unit. And I don't know why they picked Boston, why they picked, you know, they pick it so close to <clears throat> to the town. Um, from previous um, uh, presentations, we were told that we're going to have around 12 shipments of refuse a week and one out of Boston with energy. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what we, uh, we were told during the, pr the first presentation. Uh, <clears throat> My question is, because I'm very concerned about Boston and the surrounding areas, as Councillor Woodliffe stated, 70 meters chimneys, that's a very tall chimney. We don't know what it's going to produce and what effect will have on the residents of the town and the surrounding villages. It is a big project. It is a fantastic project. And I will not probably disagree with it. I will support it, in fact. Uh, it will create some jobs in Boston, definitely. As far as I'm concerned, probably 84 positions, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but I'm still concerned about why the capture unit has been increased from one to two and why we don't know yet what impact will have on the environment and the public of Boston. I will be grateful if you can answer these questions. And then there is one more concern is that uh, shredding bales, because you say they can be in, in storage areas for four to five days. And because they are general waste, will, will not this be creating more smell around Boston? and bad orders. Thank you, Gary. Okay, thank you, thank Madam you. Chairman. Thank you. Um, so um, 
the increase in CO2 was just purely because of a more flexible um, arrangement on site. So there were no other ulterior motives uh, around that. So it's just to allow, um, because we've got the space to put another one in and the client had identified that there was a potential market for that CO2, then um, we, we, we decided to do that um, in the in initial phases. There was always some um, element of wanting to put further CO2 units in further down the line when um, a greater market um, was established for it. Um, but the, the applicant has worked um, with, with potential um, opportunity for that material to be able to identify that um, we've got um, the market for it. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, we can't um, create something that there isn't a market for. Um, so that's the essential reason why um, the number of CO2 units was increased from one to two. Um, in terms of the impacts assessment, that's, that's on, ongoing at the moment. Um, we will have the outcomes of that um, assessment hopefully by the end of September and we'll be able to share um, the impact assessment from an air quality perspective and, and what the potential emission um, impacts are on the wider um, human health and environment um, aspects as well. So those are, are going to be shared with the, with the council when we get them. Not, um, not, we, they won't just be put into the application uh, and no one's going to hear anything about them. We are going to be um, sharing the findings of, um, of our environmental statement before the application is submitted. Um, in terms of jobs, um, actually, well, when we reassess the project, we, we think there's going to be slightly more um, jobs, um, so potentially over, over 100, 120 jobs in operation, um, at least 300 jobs during um, construction as well. So it will bring some, um, some economic diversification to the town. You're absolutely right in that. And, and again, as a, a kind of a flag, flagship scheme, it will potentially attract engineering um, sort of skill set to, to the town and um, we're, we're looking to engage with Boston College um, in terms of apprenticeships um, for, um, for working on the facility both during construction um, um, and the operation of the scheme and I've got a meeting tomorrow with the college to discuss just that. Um, and, and again, you, you mentioned the, um, that um, one of those um, sort of global scale disasters from a, from a facility exploding um, uh, in Toulouse. Um, and that, and along with other um, sort of schemes, um, which have which have had suffered similar things, such as Fukushima and um, Bunsfield in the UK, um, uh, as as terrible as they are, they all also allow um, the developers and 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 people who are controlling the kind of rules and regulations around the design and build of those types of plant and similar types of plant to implement more stringent technology and stringent building practices as, uh, as, they, as you learn lessons from those things. And they then go forward into, into building regulations associated with the, with the building of these, these types of structures. So there's a much tighter control um, on, um, on the, the, the build and the construction and the operation of such facilities to ensure that um, the, the chances of those happening uh, those things happening again are um, are minimised. Um, Oda, I think that was your final point. Yes. Um, so the shredding of the bales, that's in in a, um, a a building which is completely sealed, operated under negative pressure. So if if a if a door is opened in the bale shredding area, the actual air will flow in rather than flow out. And as part of, uh, you're right in, in saying that if, if anyone lifts a wheelie bin um, in summer, they, they immediately detect an odour. So hence this, um, the bales will be tightly wrapped in plastic. Um, the main focus of flow of the bales will be directly from, from the ship into uh, the bunker, into that sealed system. And we're anticipating that the, 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 the storage area on the, uh, on the wharf is minimised as much as possible. And um, from an odour perspective, the fact that they're wrapped in bales and they're not stored for a, um, for a, a long period of time means that we're minimizing the amount of odor and odor it itself will be a parameter that the, the system, the scheme is um, measured against in terms of its environmental permit to operate. So where there are any potential, what the system will, the scheme will have to be able to demonstrate in, in getting its environmental permit. And that's different to the actual consent to build. So there's the, the development consent order is a, is a consent to build the facility, but there will be an environmental permit for the facility to allow it to be operated. That will have to be able to demonstrate techniques to minimize odor um, so that there is no 
um, uh, odor beyond the site boundary. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. So uh, next is Councillor Alison Austin. If you'd like to ask your questions, please, Councillor Austin. I'm trying to get my video. Um, let me see if I can get it this time. Um, well, you don't need to see me. <laughs> um, right, thank you, um, Chairman. I, I am aware that I've perhaps, um, I've tried to stay till the end because I'm not a member of this committee. Um, and I thought that I wanted everyone else to have a go first. Right, good evening, Gary. Um, We've met many times before, haven't we? And um, I thank you very much for your um, the time that you have spent with us previously. Um, I have um, some comments and questions regarding, first of all, the CO2 um, capture, um, because I wondered how, how this compared with the previous um, gasification um, or how much emission, if you like, compared with with the um, previous one, and also um, how does this compare with um, North Highcombe? And I was a bit concerned when I think Councillor Stevens was saying, "Oh, well, we want it to stay. You know, we want Lincolnshire's waste to stay within Lincolnshire." But of course, it does because North Highcombe is in Lincolnshire, and. Um, Possibly, I'm not sure too sure about South Holland, but everyone else is. I think goes to North within Lincolnshire. Um, so I, I'm interested, please, from my first question and comment about comparisons with the um, gasification, when obviously there were some emissions, and with the um, North Highcombe uh, energy from waste, please. And then, if I may, come back for a couple of other comments after that. Thank you. Okay, so um, under the gasification um, system, um, there was only one CO2 unit. So um, the volume of um, exhaust emissions um, between the two facilities, um, the old one and the new one, without any um, carbon capture is approximately um, reasonably similar. Um, they're all in the same order of magnitude in terms of because of the amount of material processing through them and the um, the power generation um, that's been um, drawn off from those and the, the steam turbines are a similar set of technology so they're processing at the same um, power output so if you if you had no um, carbon capture on either scheme they would be approximately similar in terms of co2 emissions so what we're essentially doing is capturing 12% of the um, CO2 from two lines um, on uh, out of three um, on the EFW scheme, whereas under the gasification scheme, we were only capturing 12% out of one line. So that's the difference between the two in terms of um, CO2 capture. And then from a, how is it compared to North Highcombe? Um, proportionately, um, there's no, uh, I don't know the North Icon facility um, intimately in terms of um, what um, elements of um, abatement and um, any potential for CO2 capture, but I'm assuming it doesn't have any. So proportionately, um, the CO2, um, um, given that that is a, um, a, a, a waste-based um, uh, processing system, um, the type and profile of the emissions will be very similar. So our facility um, that we're proposing will capture proportionately more CO2 than the North Icon facility does. Right, if I may continue then, please, Gary. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I'm perfectly happy still with the site. Um, as we know, it's... Um, identified for this sort of purpose on the local minerals and waste policy and of course within the local plan um, and and fairly well in fact the prevailing wind on the whole takes things away from the town it really does um, i've lived in this area for 
quite some time and I know which way the wind goes. Um, it's not always exactly what the, you know, it's not necessarily south uh, west in this area. Um, right, now, the, the, the peer document, um, which obviously was something that was produced before the previous um, submission, I think, wasn't it? Um, has that required, you know, has that been um, updated or anything? Has or, or was that still okay to go through uh, as is? Um, because I think that was something you had to do before you could even start, wasn't it? Um, have there been any amendments to that document? I've been trying to look back to see all my questions from two years ago. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, so just, just taking those comments then. Um, so um, the prevailing wind um, at the moment, we, uh, it's an important point, but we ha obviously have to consider all potential um, wind directions that, that may affect the facility and we model accordingly, so according to the most prominent wind directions. So um, the, that's, that's factored into the, our um, air quality assessment to, to cover off um, potential wind direction. In terms of the PIR, so the preliminary environmental information report that we issued, I think it was, I think July um, last year. <clears throat> so that was submitted and we, we, we carried out a formal consultation um, when that was issued. And that document is in the process of being updated. So every facet of that document will be updated to accommodate the requirements of the proposed changes. And that will then lead to the environmental statement um, that will be submitted with the development consent order application. So when we're um, doing that, as, a, as I've mentioned, we are going to share the um, outcomes of the findings of each of the relevant topics that uh, the environmental impact assessment covers. So we're, uh, we will be sharing those before the application gets submitted with relevant stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Um, then if I may just um, sort of finish off if I can. Um, oh, I, I didn't comment perhaps it's, or as I did to you personally, but from the point of view of my residents who live on Marsh Lane, they are incredibly uh, pleased at the thought that there will be less vehicle movements, as that was a concern. Um, I was somewhat disappointed by the response that we got emailed um from the rspb because did they respond two years ago i, I wasn't aware of to me it, it seemed very negative and obviously you you can't um talk about someone else's um response but of course it's in the public domain um and um i just wondered what what's changed from you know, their, their response some um, two years ago. Um, all the designations are the same. Um, and I just wasn't aware that they went into that much detail before. Um, have you got any comments on that? Um, as much as I can, the person, um, so there's, there's two strands of the, our engagement with, um, with the RSPB and um, what we've been um, attempting to do is look at, um, obviously the birds are an important issue for the RSPB, but they're also important to Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust, the uh, Natural England, and to a certain extent, um, the Environment Agency. So we're looking at a wider stakeholder group for, for the impact on birds. And that is not just at the site, obviously, um, for, the, for the removal of, salt, uh, of mud flats that we're going to do to create the wharf, but also um, adjacent to the site for any potential roosting birds that use that, um, and also in the wash. Um, because they're going to be impacted by ships delivering um, material to them and, and taking material away. So <clears throat> we've been working with, um, with both the RSPB at Frampton, um, Frampton Marshes um, uh, on site, and we've been to that site on, on numerous occasions, and also working with the RSPB as an organisation at a, what, what I'd term a policy level. Mm -hmm. So there has been a policy, a change to the RSPB's policy contact um, from the first part of the scheme to the second part of the scheme. 
and that um, that letter that um, was um, was referred to and um, was issued um, after a meeting that we had with uh, Natural England, the Environment Agency, Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust, and the the um, policy lead for the RSPB was invited to that meeting. But unfortunately, um, that person couldn't make the first part of the meeting where we explained what the purpose of the consultation um, exercise was and explained that we were in the process of collating the bird data. So there was, I think there is an inference in that um, letter from the RSPB that we'd failed to provide things, but we didn't have the information to provide. So subsequent to that information and that letter from the RSPB, we've, we've contacted um, them and the other um, interested stakeholders with regards to birds and, and all of the other environmental impacts associated with, um, with, um, with both the marine environment, so the tidal river, um, and the land uh, that's going to be affected by the scheme to offer them assurances that uh, the applicant is, is, is dedicated to uh, ensuring that where we need to, um, in terms of um, providing appropriate habitat or where appropriate habitat is impacted by the facility will provide what's called an adequate compensation for that in terms of offering alternative habitats or, or, or compensation in the form of potential financial contribution to allow something like Frampton Marshes or Freeston to be able to develop to encourage that the species that may be affected by the scheme can continue to flourish in the, in the area um, around Boston. And the wash. Um, I, well, officially the representative of Boston Borough Council on the wash and um, North Norfolk Partnership um, is Councillor Stevens, but she's been unable, to, she's had other commitments. I, I've been the representative for several years and, or stand in, shall I say, and um, are, are, are they um, people that you consult? Um, you know, because that's obviously the, um, the whole of the, uh, well, the wash right round from, um, you know, our area right round to, to North Norfolk. And I didn't know whether, whether you get any response from them or whether they're not consultees. Um, they're not um, statutory consultees, but there's not. That doesn't mean to say that we're not um, able to um, to engage with them. I think we've, after the last round of consultations, we tried to set up an appropriate uh, meeting with them. But I, I, I don't think diary is quite aligned. But I'm still obviously open to any uh, any form of pot consultation potential. I'm quite happy to um, to, to attend any um, relevant consultation meetings with the appropriate. Um, members of my team, so the um, ecologists, terrestrial and marine ecologists who are, uh, are working with the scheme. Yeah, because of course the food chain starts right down at the bottom with the, organ the, the little organisms in the, um, in the mud, so um, yeah. you know, we've got to go right back to basics, haven't we? Right back to start. Oh, thank you very much, Gary, for um, tolerating a few more questions from you. Thank you, and thank you, Madam Chairman, for letting me Welcome, Councillor Austin. Thank you. Jeanette, do we have any further people wanting to speak? Um, no, Chairman, nobody, uh, there's no other member indicated. Okay, I think Councillor Goodell's just put his hand up. <laughs> so just to... <laughs> Councillor Goodell, do you want to go ahead? Thank you, Madam Chairman. I did put a hand on. I think it turned out to be more of a clap than a hand, but look, it's the only thing I can find. But anyway, never mind. Um, I'm actually quite supportive of this project. I, I have been all along. Um, I was sort of lucky enough, I suppose, or unlooking, which is where you want to look at it, um, to be one of the people involved in bringing the North Highcombe plant to Lincolnshire when I, I was served on the county council. Um, and I have visited a few facilities, such as the one we're proposing now, um, uh, and I have to say I've been impressed by the way they've all been run, um, especially the one which we went to see at Grimsby, which basically was the enclosed building like this one um, is proposing, and, um, and I have to say the facility was very well run, it was very clean, and everything else. I, I mean, I accept we need to be mindful of um, the... Uh, and anything that comes out of the chimney, because obviously um, 
we have uh, to be mindful of that, obviously, because of the residents uh, of the area and also what lands on the uh, on the food sources that we grow around this area. Um, but it's probably no more harmful than what the farmers spray on them. But that's another issue, I suppose. But one thing which, which Gary may be able to help me with, uh, and uh, maybe as a reassurance, when we went to, when I went to the plant at Grimsby, um, I, 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 when I, well, I asked them about what comes out the top of the chimney uh, and the emission levels, and uh, they assured me that if, if the emission levels actually went anywhere near the levels that, or the maximum levels allowed, the actual plant was shut down and stop. Um, so nothing would actually come out anyway. It would just close it down until they'd sorted the problem out. Um, so, I, I, I mean, we have to um, trust in what we're told is the levels which are safe. Uh, I know it's not always <laughs> the easiest thing to do to trust uh, the scientists, but it seems to be something we've had to do more and more over the last uh, year anyway, um, and trust the scientific community a lot more. Uh, um, and experts now seem to have a less of a, or uh, a, 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 a better reputation, shall I say, than, than they were probably tarred with a few uh, last year or the year before. Um, so I think we need to be mindful of what, of what comes out the top, and we need to be mindful of of um, of the environment, which is true. I also think that we need to be also mindful and balance that against what actually happens to this waste if it doesn't go to one of these facilities. Mm. And what, what that does to the environment. Yeah. Um, I mean, at present, I know it's going to North Highcombe, um, our ours is, but I mean, we're talking um, the, the nation as a whole uh, uh, and where it ends up. And it, it, at the end of the day, it's not just waste generated in, in Boston, the surrounding areas that actually impact on, on the environment, which we share. The whole of the country's waste actually impacts on our environment as well. And basically, uh, the, the, well, I suppose the world's to some degree, but obviously we can't uh, <laughs> we can't deal with everything. But um, I'm also concerned that we we need to be um, open and receptive to um, to industry, uh, and not uh, obviously we need to make sure the safeguards are in place. But if they are, we need to be as open and receptive as we can. Um, I've been on this council a long time, and. <laughs> some would say for my sins but um uh, uh, members may may remember or may not a while ago when the, there was the the uh, the chance of a steel mill coming to boston and that was basically um voted against uh, by well, one or two votes but anyway it was voted against by members um and to be honest that put boston back a long way because based the information or the, the 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 feeling around was that Boston wasn't open to to industry, wasn't open to business, uh, um, and we were closed to any 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 initiatives to to um, bring in new new initiatives and new new commerce and new industry, and that put the town back a quite a number of years to rebuild that trust again and confidence, and, and I think it's it's to our credit that um, this, this site has, has been chosen for this facility because at the end of the day, it is private money and it's a, a rather large investment um, and it will um, bring quite a number of jobs to Boston for a number of years. And I think that's something we, we, we can't really, um, you know, uh, dis dismiss. I appreciate everything has to be balanced and we have to really look at everything else. But um, on and on the on the but in the picture as a, on, on the whole thing is around. Um, I, I am more concerned with what happens to our waste if we don't um, treat it in this way. At the end of the day, <coughs> I appreciate that we're going to get harmful. <coughs> excuse me, Adam Chim. Harmful gases emitted from the burning of this. We get harmful gases emitted from the rotting down of it. We also get hundreds and hundreds of years of just stuff just laid in the ground. Um, and it's now entering the food chain. Um, so it is what is more actually more environmentally you know, beneficial to, to the, us as a whole. I think we also need to take that into account. So um, I do support it, although I am, I, I say I'm wary of the, of the consequences of the emissions, but I do support it. 
Um, I think it's some uh, we're good for the town, good for the area, um, and I hope that it will actually um, put Boston in a in a better light when it comes to attracting more diverse industries to the town by actually saying that we are open to looking look at different um, industries and different things, providing the safeguards are in place. I mean, I think I, I, well, I do, I do, I do applaud the fact that they're actually. You know, changing their construction plans to actually take more lorries off the road and bring more in by the river, um, so bulking ships so that it actually would reduce the number of vehicles coming through the town because obviously that site it has to come through the town. Um, well, well, not necessarily, through, but or if it comes on the proper road, it comes down Marsh Lane and along the the major roads. So I mean, I think it's. Um, I, I have to applaud them for the, the amount of work they've put in. I thank Gary for his, his presentation. I think it's it it's just reassured a lot me a lot uh on on the way that it's been done. I think you gain a lot of the people you're dealing with by the presentations they make uh, and uh, you know and how you, how you can trust companies to do the right thing. Uh, and it appears to me that the the diligence that Gary has has, has told us this evening that the companies have gone to to actually to get this facility to this stage would actually suggest to me that they are a company that um, you know are, are worth dealing with uh, for, uh, and, and and will not uh, not sort of backslide on us as it were so I'm, I'm I'm very happy to support it and I think as a council which I, I appreciate the decision won't be ours anyway um, but I do hope the council, as a consultee, is supportive of this. Uh, and um, I appreciate the minister will make the decision. Um, but I do hope the council will be supportive of this because I, I do think that it's, uh, it's something that um, it will put Boston in a good light. On, 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 at the end of the day, I, you know, it, it will bring much needed jobs to this area, good quality jobs, um, well paid jobs. <laughs> Which we def which we desperately need. We keep complaining about things leaving the town, so we should. Uh, I won't say be obstacleless to bring stuff in, but we'll make sure as, as many safeguards are in place as possible. But I, I think we should be as receptive as possible to to any you know industries such as this that want to come to the town. Thank you, Madam Chairman. They're just some observations, but uh, I, I, you know I think we can become over critical and over the. Uh, you know, overprotective of, of this area um, for whatever reason. I, I appreciate they're all very good and valid reasons, but I do think at the end of the day, we have to trust in the, the scientific community and what they tell us is a safe level. It, the next year might prove to be an unsafe level. I appreciate that, but, um, you know, but when technology changes, um, so will everything else. The environment will change and so will um, the government's... Uh, Industrial, uh, industrial standards and environmental standards. So um, that can only improve it. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome, Councillor Goodell. Jeanette, yes. Um, Councillor Nigel Walton wishes to speak as one of the portfolio holders, Madam Chairman. Okay, thank you. Councillor Walton, if you'd like to comments. There we go, unmute myself. That always works well, doesn't it? Um, yeah, I just want to thank Gary for the, the detail in which he's brought to us tonight. And I know this has been a long process and um, I'm looking forward to getting shovels in the ground. Um, a few people have mentioned this already tonight and Boston is definitely open for business. This is just one of the many projects that our team are working on um, behind the scenes to increase jobs, increase the wealth of the town and bring things forward. We remember that Boston started off as a port and over many years the port has deteriorated and you know its volume has, has gone down. This is going to bring more, more boats into the town, it's going to do lots of things for the port um, and I, I can't see you know any reason personally for, for me to be even thinking negatively about this at all. The, the rubbish has got to go somewhere. And if, if it doesn't come here and gets dealt with, then it'll go somewhere else. Now, 
the investment into this town is not just about the long-term jobs, it's about the short-term jobs, it's about the supply chains, it's about what happens to the port, and it will kickstart a, a big um, interest into Boston as a place to come and do business. Um, and the, the positivity that we um, are getting at the moment from national, international businesses, big players in the market that are looking to, to come to Boston. And the, the fact that that kind of positivity on an industrial level is, is coming to this town at the moment is, is because of big national infrastructure projects like this. So from my point of view and for my portfolio, obviously my focus and my portfolio is about jobs, it's about the economy and without jobs and without a strong economy, then the, the town suffers. So if we can bring jobs, we can increase the economy, we can increase the national and international profile of this town, then that can only be a good thing for the people of this town. And if we start bringing some high tech jobs that this is going to bring, then that will kickstart so many other industries that we, we really need in this town. And I'm just going to close on, on one thing and say it again, Boston is definitely open for business. Thank you, Madam Chairman. You're welcome, Councillor Wilson. If there's no further further speakers, I would just love, like to add my 10 pence, pence worth. <laughs> That's all right, everybody. <laughs> okay, Gary. I just wanted the rest of the committee members to know that uh, I'd speak, spoken to you previously and what I'd sort of mentioned. Um, some of it was during con construction. Um, it, 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 with the barrier, it, it brought to my mind that they'd done some piling for that and that you would need to do that in some of your construction. Um, and I was just concerned about um, the notification that residents would get when you were going to do the piling. Um, it's not just a case of doing it in the day because obviously shift workers cannot uh, sometimes sleep during the day. Um, and uh, I'd just like you to reiterate your comments again so that the committee members can hear it. Um, and the other one was that you, pr you promised me that there was a cast iron guarantee that the plant will only process UK waste for the lifespan of the facility. And um, also that uh, after the, uh, the lifespan facility is around 25 years and at the end of, li of life, they, uh, you will have a responsibility for reinstating the, the site as well. Um, and I think uh, I'm pleased to hear as well that you're going to um, pursue the willingness to take local waste because obviously the North Highcombe plant will reach its maximum capacity um in the near future um and also i would like to to know that we're, all committee members have sight of the impact assessment um that we, we do out at the end of september october so we can see with that just uh, and over over all i'm very supportive of the um of the facility and and what councillor welton and councillor goodell have said okay thank you hopefully you can can't quite hear the kettle boiling in the background. Um, uh, my son's just making a coffee. Um, so um, yeah, from a barrier perspective and the piling, yeah, we, we've I, I've been in touch with the barriers um, liaison, uh, community liaison officer, to pick up some good tips in terms of how um, to in, in, engage with the local community on. Um, potential piling so we're going to take some of that feedback on board and make sure that when um, anything that um, is related to things like piling which we'll need to do for the wharf and and some of the um, foundation work that uh, we're we're providing as adequate notice as possible uh, and communicating that through a wide range of media so it's it's a matter of taking that feedback um, there's good experience in the town um, of, of how that's been handled previously and we want to take the good things out of that so that's that's something that will be happening um, yes, um, only processing UK waste. That was um, me putting my foot down absolutely in earlier days of this project and, and in absolutely insisting that there would be no um, waste imported uh, to come to this facility. Um, and that will be written into the development consent order. And, and for those of you who don't, um, um, don't know these things, the development consent order is actually a piece of legislation. So that will legislate that only UK waste can come to the facility. Um, in terms of decommissioning, we, there is um, 
as part of the impact assessment, we have to identify what um, the potential impacts are on, on decommissioning of a project like this. And um, we nominally work for these types of facilities on a 25 year lifespan. And what was likely to happen is that um, period, um, um, as we get towards a 25 year period, or as if the technology changes, and as mentioned previously, um, environmental um, assessment changes through um, through requirements of, of various new and stricter standards, the ability of the facility to perform to those um, standards will be continually assessed. And at the point where the facility can either not be demonstrated to meet um, future standards or can't be retrofitted to meet um, retro uh, future standards, it will be decommissioned to the to the to the level and as part of the um, environmental permitting requirements you have to leave a facility a place when you remove um, a permit from a facility you have to leave it in the condition that it was found so the facility will be taken down um, and the and the land left um, in a in a state where it's not going to cause any um, subsequent harm to human health or the environment um, one thing the one feature that will remain will be the wharf um, because we're building the wharf to maintain a, a flood defence standard, um, we will be retaining the wharf as part of the structure to ensure the future protection um, of the town. Um, we've, we've, we've already covered, I think, the willingness to take local waste. That's that's something that we, we want to try and do. Um, but obviously, that's subject to um, the procurement rules and and um, and, and the requirements of um, the Lincolnshire County Council as, as Waste Disposal Authority. And again, um, I, can, I will say that the impact assessment um, findings will be circulated once we've completed that process at the end of this month, early um, next month. Hopefully that answers the questions. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Guy. You're welcome. Uh, so, committee, uh, there is a recommendation um, within this report, so I'm just going to, to read it out, um, and then I'll ask Jeanette to take a for, against, or abstain um, vote on it. Um, the recommendation is that the committee agree delegation to the Assistant Director of Regulation, which is Christian, in consultation with the Leader of the Council and the Portfolio Holder for Economic Development, Planning and the Environment finalised the Council's submission in response to the Phase 4 consultation. Okay, so if everybody's clear on that, if Jeanette, you could take the... Yes, uh, Madam Chairman, um, could we have a proposer in seconder? I propose it. I'm happy. Councillor Thank you. Thank you. I'm Second happy. Madam Chair. Is that Councillor Wellborn? Yes, it is. Thank you. Right then, thank you. I'll um, read out members, uh, committee members' names in alphabetical order, and if you could say for, against, or abstain. Councillor Corner. For. Uh, Councillor Danny. For. Councillor Evans. For. Councillor Goodale. For. Councillor Hasty. For. Councillor Judith Skinner, Madam oh. Chairman. Uh, Councillor Watson. Oh. Councillor Wellborn. Oh. And Councillor Woodleaf. Against. Against. Yes. That's clearly carried, Madam Chairman. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, tonight. That concludes um, this evening's business. And uh, my thanks go to everybody that attends, especially Gary, for his very clear and concise presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Gary. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everybody.